Hello and welcome to today's webcast. My name is Jimmy Carroll. I'm the Senior Web Editor of Vision Systems Design. Today's event, Five Reasons to Use an LED Controller, will be presented by John Merva, Vice President, North America at Gardasoft. Before we begin, we wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. If you have any questions or issues during the webcast, you can click on the Ask a Question area of the console. We'll try to answer these questions during the live Q&A portion at the end of the webcast. If you have any audio issues, please try refreshing your page. If this doesn't work or if you have any other issues during the webcast, please click the Ask a Question area of the console and a member of our webcast support team will work with you to correct the issue. For your convenience, this presentation will be available on demand within 24 hours of the live event. A reminder email message will be sent to all registrants with a link to the archive. It will also be accessible from our home page. John's slides will also be available for download today, and these can be accessed via the Event Resources section under the Ask a Question area. Before we get started, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Gardasoft. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce John. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for taking the time to attend our webinar today. I trust you'll find it useful, so uh, let's jump right in here. First question maybe some of you are asking yourself is, why should I be interested in LED controllers? So I thought it would be interesting or important to state a couple of basic reasons, and uh, hopefully that will secure your interest through the best of this presentation. So I imagine you're all using machine vision or industrial imaging in some sort. And uh, do you need accurate, repeatable measurements? Are you doing high-speed imaging? Do you need multiple images from a single camera? Do you desire long and predictable LED life? And would you like to future-proof your installation so that you're prepared for changes or enhancements that might be necessary as time goes on? If you answer yes to any of these, I think you'll find this an interesting presentation. So today uh, we're going to cover a few areas. Um, and we're going to start with electrical properties and basic powering of an LED. From that, we'll jump right into the five reasons that uh, you should use an LED controller. Uh, after that, we'll have a look at uh, what are the features of controllers and how sh should I go about choosing one for my own needs. Of course, the elephant in the room is always financial justification. And at the end, I'm going to relate three stories uh, from my own personal experience of 20 years in the uh, machine vision lighting industry of when a controller uh, saved the day or turned out to be a really good feature to have on the line. So with that in mind, let's move into uh, the first area, electrical properties and powering an LED. So I think most of us know what an LED is. It uh, stands for light emitting diode. Uh, it's a semiconductor device that's been around for some time. Uh, and as you know, they emit light when powered. Uh, they've been in use in the machine vision industry, again, for at least 20 years at this point, a little over 20. But now today, I think most of us are familiar. We probably have them in our homes or we see them in commercial residential places and even in street lighting where, because they're very efficient and very long life when used in the correct way. Now, uh, it's important to note that the cord resistance or voltage that uh, takes to drive an LED changes with the temperature of the junction of the LED. And this graph on the right uh, represents that. It shows forward voltage on the vertical axis uh, and temperature on the horizontal axis. And you can see as temperature rises, the forward voltage drops consistently and, and significantly. So the message here is when uh, when you control current, you can control light output, but you can't uh, control that by controlling voltage only. As we look a little deeper here, we have a, a typical LED output curve. Uh, the curved line in the graph represents light output. The vertical axis is current driven through the LED, and the horizontal axis is the voltage applied to the LED. So as we look at the, this graph, we can see that a small change, uh, in this case we've uh, delineated a 10% voltage increase, 250 millivolt, which actually doubles the output current of the LED and hence 
uh, doubles the light output of the LED. So we can see that uh, LED brightness varies linearly with current, but uh, there's quite a multiplicative effect with voltage. And so again, this, the message here is why we want to consider uh, driving LEDs from a current model rather than a voltage model. Now, question running through many of your minds is, well, what is a current model or a current source? I mean, it's kind of a, uh, a different idea to get your head around uh, for most of us who uh, were only shown voltage sources and then how to derive current through a circuit. Uh, and I've represented these two circuits here uh, with the voltage uh, source circuit showing the voltage source and the LEDs uh, connected to it. Uh, in actual practice, there's typically a biasing resistor added to the circuit to help uh, set the LEDs at the right voltage. So how does a current source differ? Well, actually, it, it's similar in some ways, but a control loop is, la is wrapped around the voltage source that measures the current uh, being output into the circuit. And that loop then adjusts the voltage in a minute way, up or down, to maintain the current at an exact level. Uh, and this is how that occurs, and it's uh, why it's important to have this type of source uh, when driving LEDs. There's a, uh, another way that you'll find uh, of driving LEDs known as pulse width modulation. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this also. It really uh, has to do with uh, providing a square wave that's oscillating at some higher frequency, uh, hopefully. Uh, it is with a specific voltage. And then the time that the uh, pulse width modulated square wave is on out of the total period uh, controls the amount of intensity. So at 100% intensity, it looks like DC voltage. Uh, at lower intensities, it looks uh, like the examples on the right here. Uh, and again, it's important to note the modulation frequency must be very high here because if it's low and we end up with different portions of cycles in each image, you're going to see a variation uh, in the intensity from uh, the pulse width modulation cycle in addition to any voltage changes that might occur. All right. so. Given a little background information, uh, let's talk about the five reasons that you would want to personally uh, use an LED controller. So reason one, consistent light levels between images. This allows accurate, repeatable measurements. Now, most of you as, as users of a machine vision system understand that it's important to have uh, image to image a consistency with light level, and that's not only on a daily basis, uh, but on a weekly, a monthly, or a yearly basis. Um, I'll show an example here of a sub-pixel measurement of a feature uh, shown in this image. Uh, you can see the measurement that we've taken at 16.706 uh, pixels, uh, again facilitated by a sub-pixel algorithm. These are generally pretty robust, but if you were to vary the image by just reducing the light level by a mere 10%, uh, we can see a change of 0.073 pixels. And you say, well, not very much, but the truth of it is, how much variation can you accept in a world where five nines quality is the goal? That's just one part measured or judged incorrectly with respect to tolerance limits out of 100,000 pieces. So even a subtle change can result in either you uh, judging bad parts as good parts or forcing you to crank in tolerance limits tighter, uh, thereby uh, rejecting good parts that otherwise would be uh, good parts and calling them bad parts. Reason two. Strobed or pulse lighting freezes motion in high-speed applications and overcomes ambient light. Okay, so let's talk about that. Uh, what is strobing or pulsing? I think that most of us are familiar with this from using our own cameras, uh, whether they be a handheld camera 
or on our smartphone. Um, a strobe in a short period of time has a way of freezing motion, which is great if you're going to image moving parts. Uh, there are other advantages to this, and the primary one is that for short pulses, it's possible to overdrive LEDs by much more than the normal continuous uh, drive level as far as current goes or brightness goes. Uh, and sometimes this can literally be 10 times more current than is applied to the LED in uh, short periods of time. And this can result in five, six, eight times more brightness than would be achieved uh, from a continuous powering state. Now the important thing here is uh, that we have to be careful that we don't overheat the junction of the LED. LEDs, as we noted, are semiconductors, and semiconductors fail when they are overheated. It's the most likely reason to kill a semiconductor is, not, is to not dissipate heat from the device correctly or to use it in a fashion that causes too much heat to be built up. So this means that any controller that's uh, driving in pulse mode and is taking full advantage of overdrive must also uh, carefully monitor the pulse width and repetition, repetition rate, i.e. duty cycle, uh, to prevent the overheating of the LEDs. Now the result of this uh, is shown you know, clearly in this image. We have uh, two uh, moving bottles here. Uh, one is imaged with continuous illumination. The other is frozen with a strobe pulse. Again, I imagine most of you are uh, familiar with this technique. Uh, now let's look at some of the important details of doing this. Here's some scope traces of pulsed, uh, pulses delivered to LEDs by controllers. Uh, and on the left, we have a pulse shape uh, from a controller that doesn't have great pulse shaping, and on the right, one that has pretty doggone good uh, pulse shaping. Now you'll notice uh, the key areas uh, called out by the arrows here. Uh, first are the rising and falling edges of the pulse. And the difference here is that, of course, the squarer this pulse is, the more light you're going to get under the pulse, thereby uh, making it the most efficient way of delivering light to the uh, camera. Uh, secondly, you'll notice along the top edge some ringing occurs. Uh, this is kind of common in high-speed circuits uh, where there's some inductive and capacitance involved. Um, and what you're seeing here is a different amounts of ringing. Again, these things all impact the repeatability of the pulse and the amount of light delivered in the pulse. So these are important things to pay attention to uh, when pulsing LEDs. A, a few other uh, rules that are important to, to note. Uh, you always want to keep your pulse time uh, less than the time it takes for the part to travel two pixels. This should be considered an absolute maximum, um, and less than that's even better, but the chances are you'll have blur uh, at anything above that, and blur is going to interfere with your ability to actually uh, obtain good images. As I mentioned, uh, good pulse shaping is important uh, because good pulse shaping allows the maximum amount of light to be delivered in a given pulse, and it also ensures pulse-to-pulse uh, -pulse repeatability. And the real message here, again, uh, as we recall from what we looked at a little bit ago, pulse-to-pulse uh, -pulse repeatability requires current control. All right, moving on to reason number three. Uh, one camera allows images with different light levels or different lighting geometries. Now, Again, as we had mentioned here, uh, in the U.S. especially, but in the world, it's kind of common to use smart cameras, which have uh, a single image sensor and a single chance to view one image at a time. Uh, but these reasons all apply to a system that uh, uses a PC-based approach and, and processes the images back to the PC or sends the images back to the PC for processing as well. Um, it allows you to obtain different views of the part from a single camera by either changing uh, from one light to another to another, or in some cases, um, there are actually a need to have different light levels or series of pulses required 
for the types of inspections being performed. Uh, and uh, a controller facilitates this, allowing you to accomplish these goals. Uh, these next images here show a single part, which we've imaged with three different lighting geometries. Uh, the upper right image has been imaged at one geometry to facilitate the viewing of the barcode or the reading of the barcode. In the, I'm sorry, that was the upper left image. In the upper right image, we've imaged the part to enhance the scratch that is visible in the screen. And in the third uh, image on the bottom, the goal has been to image it for measurement features. Now these are representative, and, and of course there's many different uh, approaches to this, but they're again just examples of how uh, one camera can use a controller to either uh, use different lights or different light levels to enhance the value or the, the amount of uh, value received from a single camera. Reason four, easy standardized control of detailed lighting parameters direct from your machine vision platform. As we look at uh, slide 21, uh, we see an example of how connecting to a controller from your computer is, uh, allows you to not only to configure the controller. Now, something we haven't mentioned, but I think is um, kind of intuitive here, that all power supplies, control driver devices need to know what the load is out there. And as you all know, the number of different kinds, sizes, shapes of LED lights available in the marketplace is, is a large, large number. So it's important when connecting a light to a controller that the controller uh, be configured to understand what that load is and how to drive it. So an Ethernet connection allows easy configuration because it allows you to connect your uh, EC to the device and accurately set those parameters, or if you have a, a properly enabled type of uh, controller, the controller will actually automatically configure itself. And this has been um, a feature prevalent from some manufacturers for some time. Uh, it's just the functionality is, is increasing as time goes on. Slide 22 here uh, just shows, you know, this kind of configuration on a network uh, topography as we would see it working. So we have lights on the right-hand side, the lower right here, that when connected to the controller, automatically configure the controller because the controller knows it, the identity of the light and what its drive parameters are. The controller then connects to the uh, Geeky Vision network, which allows it to uh, talk to and be controlled either by a smart camera uh, or other camera, and likewise be controlled or configured from the PC, which is hosting the uh, network. Uh, all this is important. Reason five, always the most popular with certain elements of your organization, is using a controller actually reduces cost. As we've already mentioned, it increases machine vision system accuracy which means only the parts which are truly bad parts will be rejected. It also allows uh, you to have accurate status information about the state of your light and lighting system. Uh, if something's starting to go wrong, it can communicate and tell your machine vision system in advance so this can be preemptively taken away or taken care of. Uh, preventative maintenance can be performed. If you know the hours the system has been operating and you know the predicted life of the light, this allows you to know when to replace that light before a system failure occurs. And of course, uh, driving an LED at the right current levels uh, and keeping the die junction temperatures at the correct levels is gonna ensure that you're gonna get the absolute maximum life from your LED. So those are the highlights of the five reasons. Let's talk about how you might choose a controller, keeping those reasons in mind.
So let's talk a little bit first about the maybe different ways you might differentiate uh, the different means of powering uh, or driving uh, an LED light. I guess most of us are familiar with a standard power supply. Uh, these used to be 12 volts, now they're mostly 24. Um, and as we've seen from the graphs we've looked at, um, that ripple instability impact uh, the intensity of the light when just using a power supply. The second category, though, is a driver, and a driver is something that might be embedded into the light head. It might be in the cable. Uh, it's a limited functionality type of device. It could be voltage uh, or pulse with modulation or current drive. Uh, it's capable of providing some features, but not all the features of a full function controller. A controller, on the other hand, is a device that would have uh, strobe uh, or continuous or more than likely both capabilities built into a single unit. Uh, it's going to have flexible triggers that will allow you to reassign those triggers or use them in different ways, uh, either triggering multiple channels from a single trigger or some channels from others. Uh, internal timers to determine pulse width or length of operations or pulse sequences. Um, Ethernet or RS-232 communications, and quite often uh, Gig e vision and GeniCam compliancy. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. I uh, just want to look at this whole issue again of uh, voltage versus current in driving an LED. And I think this is really a, a key issue. And again, noting that uh, if you're only using a power supply, you're going to be susceptible to ripple and, and change in power supply output over time. Uh, the same is true to a certain extent with pulse width modulation because these are typically voltage devices as well. Uh, again, inline drivers may offer current drive but not full functionality where a external controller is going to have the most functionality and also offer current drive. Now, some features to pay attention to when selecting different controllers. Uh, first of all, there's accuracy and repeatability, uh, important depending on the needs of your application. The power handling capacity of the controller you choose. As you know, uh, some LED lights are quite small and quite functional for their needs, and others are large and require a lot of power. And it kind of depends, you know, for, as an example, are we looking at uh, semiconductor parts or electronics parts, or are you uh, making sure the right tire wheel combination is, is there for an automobile? So this will become an important uh, decision point when choosing your controller. Pulse shaping, as we already mentioned, uh, helps determine that you get the light, amount of light energy per unit time and the most per unit time in functionality. Again, strobe, continuous, or both in one unit, often you don't know when you start a project what you're going to need. External communications, uh, timers, lighthead communications, and current drive are all important features. What about external communications? How are they used? Why are they important? Well, we've already mentioned RS-232 and Ethernet, but USB could be included in this, although not nearly as prevalent as the other two. Um, some cases, this is used only to configure the controller, but in other times, uh, the capability of the controller allows runtime control, uh, allowing the machine vision system to talk to the controller uh, as it's operating. And this could be to provide batch changes as you move from one uh, part number to another, which has different features or different light settings required. Uh, and uh, this often means there's some type of software development kit or special application required uh, from that machine vision system or to be developed by the uh, user. Uh, compliance with standards here is, is uh, another thing to consider. As many of you uh, are aware, maybe others not, that the various uh, geographic or global machine vision uh, groups have been working for many years now to align their efforts so that standards uh, help manufacturers 
uh, coalesce features and go in the same direction, which also speeds development and helps end users. So uh, that includes the AIA, the EMVA, uh, the GIA from Japan, the CMVU from China, uh, the VDMA from uh, Germany, and there's even interest from uh, Korea in joining. Uh, this includes uh, the Gigi Vision Standards, which were originally developed to allow the high-speed transmission of images across uh, Gigi Ethernet or higher-based uh, Ethernet uh, 10 gig and 100 gig, which are now uh, coming out, um, but includes communication of non-imaging devices, and that's where LED controllers, among other types of devices, fit in. Uh, also, there's the GeniCam standard. This uh, standard facilitates how a device is identified on the network and how you would talk to it. And an important um, part of that standard, which has uh, been developed here uh, recently and continues to be developed, is the standard feature naming convention. And this allows devices of, of similar nature, uh, in this case a machine vision lighting controller, to have common registers for common control. And this means that if you could change from one manufacturer's device to another manufacturer's device and not have to change your software, um, which is important for future proofing and flexibility and also yields uh, the most effort if for integrators, uh, end users, and OEMs alike. You don't have to rewrite software to make a change. Now, lighthead communications is also important. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, there have been manufacturers literally for 20 years uh, putting devices in the light head which allow those devices to be identified the minute they're connected to a controller and classifies the load to the controller. So it eliminates the need for a manual intervention uh, or setup by the part of the installing engineer. And, you know, that's not a hard thing to do, but it's a place for mistakes to be made and mistakes are made there. Uh, so. With having this type of communications, uh, it allows the controller to instantly know the load characteristics. It means there's no actions required on the part of the installation engineer. And uh, in some of these systems uh, actually record uh, the light in use time. It could be power on time or strobe on time or, or light temperatures that uh, the light's been exposed to. All these things are important. Uh, additionally, uh, error reporting, if the light or the circuitry of the cabling, things start to change and the power requirements to be delivered to the light change, the uh, system can report that. The LED controller can report that to the machine vision system, allowing action to be taken before failure occurs. Uh, the last item here, which I think is uh, you know, not largely um, uh, taken advantage of but could be, is the fact that LED lights, the same model of light, serial number to serial number, vary, and it's just hard to change that. In most manufacturers, this is a plus or minus 5% kind of variation. And the reason is, it's because of the variation in the actual LEDs supplied by the manufacturers of LEDs. Um, these groups of LEDs are, are divided into different power output ranges in a technique known as binning, which, you know, literally involves sorting the LEDs based on output. But those ranges are quite large, often compared to the requirements of a machine vision system. And many end users, uh, especially global enterprise type companies, have copy exact requirements. They want a light with serial number 10 to behave the same way as a light with serial number 100 whether they be installed in the U.S. or in Singapore or in Germany. So uh, having uh, light head communications and some active intelligence in the light would allow a manufacturer to program the lights at manufacturing time uh, to be of a much closer tolerance than the plus or minus 5% that is normally achieved. Okay, so now we move to the... Uh, the elephant in the room here is uh, financial justification. Now, I have to say that in my travels as I talk to end users, uh, integrators, OEMs, 
often they say, well, gee, you know, this idea of a controller really appeals to me, and I like it, but I can't justify the cost. And the point here is to point out that really it's going to save you money in the end. And, uh, you know, let's just take a quick look at the typical machine vision system cost, right? You're going to have anywhere between five and $10,000 in a smart camera. Another $1,000 in a lens, maybe less, maybe more. A light, $1,000, not that much different. Um, installation, at least $1,000, could be several thousand dollars. So you're going to have twelve to $17,000, give or take, invested in this system. A typical light controller is on the order of $500 per channel, regardless of who you buy it from. So you're looking at, you know, 3%. Increase in the cost of your system, but you get all the benefits that we've talked about. So let's just see, uh, take a look at how the five reasons help you get approval and, and the impacts here. As, and we've mentioned some of this earlier, but just to kind of reiterate, consistent image to image light levels uh, means the inspection results are going to be the same uh, hour to hour, day to day, week to week, year to year. This means you can set your tolerance limits very precisely. It means mm, less false rejects, which are important because you're throwing away good product. False accepts an even bigger problem because those units often don't meet your end customer's requirements. Uh, and that's not good for customer confidence. And as we talked before, the five nines quality, which is kind of a, the current goal globally for uh, manufacturing, you really need to take advantage of every everything you can to achieve that, and uh, consistent lighting helps you get there. Uh, strobed or pulse lighting, as I mentioned before, helps you run lines faster, uh, means you don't have to start or stop, have indexing types of motions uh, to image parts and do them in a, in a very nice way. Um, reason three, one camera, many images. This allows you to have less camera stations, which means less cameras, lenses, mounting hardware, uh, space on the line, extra conveyor space, whatever it may be. Reason four, allows you to control lighting directly from a machine vision platform. This allows fast and accurate uh, product changeover. This is becoming increasingly important, again, in global enterprise companies who download product recipes from their mainframes to the programmable controllers, to the machine vision systems, to the lighting controllers as a product changeover is made and allows uh, insurance uh, uh, that the correct menu is being used at the correct time. It also allows closed loop adaptive lighting. We mentioned early on that LED uh, forward voltage resistance also changes with age. Uh, and um, over the long term, it allows you to adjust for that. It also could mean that environmental issues uh, such as uh, ambient light or whatever things that influence the, the uh, inspection scene can be uh, adapted for uh, bringing the light back to normal, nominal levels. Uh, lastly, it reduces costs, and let's face it, that's what the boss management really cares about. Uh, facilitates quick deployment of a system, uh, allows remote preventative maintenance, and, and, and again, there's the whole issue of overall efficiency. You can run your lines faster. You can uh, guarantee higher uh, efficient output if you're not throwing away good parts, and that means it's uh, able to get more capacity from your existing uh, manufacturing capital equipment. So the last area of our presentation today uh, talks about some experiences that I've had in my years of working in the LED lighting industry, uh, both providing lighting and lighting controllers, of times when the lighting controller made a big difference in a situation. So uh, the first one fell under reason one, consistent light levels, uh, related to me by a, a manufacturing engineer who had a system installed, uh, system ran well for a year or so, 
um, pretty soon the system wasn't performing well. It was rejecting good parts and allowing bad parts to be accepted, so the engineer was called to the machine. Immediately suspected light aging uh, because he could see the low light levels. Um, replaced the light, did not fix the problem. A further investigation revealed that the um, commonly available 24 volt supply, you know, which we all know are made in very large numbers uh, and for very expensive, had actually dropped in voltage in this period of time uh, from 24 to 22 and a half volts, which is a big, big deal, right? So uh, a LED controller was installed. I'm sure the power supply was replaced as well, and long-term performance was achieved. Uh, the second time that a controller had a major impact was uh, through the use of strobe lighting. And this is a case where uh, the MV provider, machine vision provider, system integrator was sent an engineer to commission machine at a customer site. Uh, the application was originally qualified in continuous mode, should have worked just fine that way. Uh, once the machine was installed on the factory floor, it was found out that uh, ambient light levels were interfering and it wasn't uh, convenient, I should say, to add shielding to eliminate these other interfering lights which were creating image noise. Uh, so uh, the engineer was able to simply reprogram the system and move to overdrive pulse mode uh, since a controller was there. The camera exposure was shortened to align with the uh, pulse of the light uh, so that they were occurring simultaneously. Ambient light was uh, eliminated and uh, satisfactory commissioning was achieved. Reason four, uh, control lighting via machine vision platform. In this case, a uh, system was installed and working well with the products which were originally uh, specified to be inspected by the system. Uh, some time went by and new products were added to the production line. This required a change uh, of light levels and required this to be done in a quick fashion on the factory floor as batch changes were made. So uh, an LED controller with Ethernet communications was installed. Uh, the machine vision program was edited to allow for setup of the new product, uh, and the operator is now able to select a new product change from the menu and light levels automatically change. And I would add that there are a number of uh, uh, existing uh, programs or applications for machine vision systems to make this uh, easy depending upon the manufacturer that you choose. Uh, so that kind of concludes the primary agenda. I just wanted to show you a couple of the products that we uh, manufacture and provide. Uh, and a note here that 1, 2, 4, 8, and 16 channel models are available as standard products and literally some of these are available to ship uh, in a day or so. Uh, all these models have current drive and are continuous and strobe capable. Uh, and most of these models are now Trinity enabled, uh, which we invite you to talk to us about to learn more about. A little bit about the company, uh, Gardasoft, we've been around since 1999, uh, producing LED lighting controllers for the machine vision industry. We are uh, the global leader in LED control technology. Uh, in the last year or so, we have become part of the Optex group. Uh, Optex is a Japanese uh, firm uh, traded on the JASDAQ, uh, doing in the area of $300 million per year in revenue. So our company is backed up uh, by a major global supplier. Uh, we do have offices here in the United States in Ware, New Hampshire, with our primary facility uh, being in Cambridge in the UK. And we show a picture here of the building uh, which we occupy uh, two sections of there. Um, the, um, sorry about that. So that concludes the presentation. Um, as uh, was mentioned earlier, you can feel free to go to the uh, website to find uh, more information out and download this presentation. And I want to thank you all very much uh, for uh, standing by and listening and hope you found this useful. And I think we're ready to take some questions now. 
Indeed we are, John. Thank you. Um, so just a reminder to everybody, if they have a question, that they can use the Ask a Question area of your console to do that. And so with that, I will read our first question here, which asks, does overdriving really work, and will it damage my lights? Well, uh, yes, it does work. It's uh, been commonly used for uh, just about the whole time that LEDs have been used uh, in the uh, machine vision illumination world. Now, uh, it does allow higher currents to be driven uh, through the LED, so that means that uh, heating of the junction does occur. However, if the uh, on-time or overall duty cycle is limited, this allows enough time for the junction to cool in between uh, pulses, and thereby maintaining, uh, in many cases, a cooler junction temperature than would be available um, if you were continuously powering the light. So in the end, uh, it does not, not only does it not damage the light, it probably means you're going to get much longer life from your unit because the effective on time of the light has been reduced substantially due to the fact you're only turning it on for very short pulses. Thank you. So the next question I have for you here asks, how do you pitch this in 20 seconds or so, supposing you're on a cold call with a good prospect and want to get his interest? Well, you know, I think the, the real issue uh, is that LED controllers actually do save you money in the end, right? So their value exceeds their cost. However, it's the cost of the controller, which often is the objection from the customer's perspective, right? It's, it's money that they hadn't budgeted or hadn't planned for. So uh, my suggestion would be, A, uh, point out the fact that it's probably a very small percentage, as I noted earlier, typically, you know, three to four percent of your system cost. And there's all these advantages uh, that it will give you longer life, higher output, less rejects, uh, less false rejects, and keeping of good parts. Thank you, John. Next question I have for you here says, do these, controller, do these controllers have any dedicated input to accept encoders trigger? Um, our current model line does not have LED controllers which can accept. I take that back. It does, we actually make an accessory that accepts encoder triggers and we have recently uh, integrated the uh, trigger timing control function into some of our controllers so that it is available uh, along with a lighting controller in a single unit. Thank you. Next question asks, how does the controller identify the light and power load at power up? Uh, this can happen in a couple different ways. In the early uh, implementation of this, um, it was done by uh, inserting a resistor in the connector of the light head, and the resistor had uh, a number of values. I think it was uh, four or five values, and it separated the light into a load class. So the controller actually measured the resistor and said, okay, it's the load class one or a load class three. Uh, the next implementation is there's actually an EEPROM inserted in the light, which is programmed with some parameters that the controller can read. Uh, and the more sophisticated uh, use of this, which is uh, used in the Gardasoft Trinity system, is uh, an, actually a microcontroller is inside the, the light cable or light head, which is programmed with, in their non-volatile memory with the load class, but also uh, other drive factors and drive profiles. And this also allows the uh, light head to store uh, the on-time, the powered on-time, the pulsed on-time, uh, information, the serial number of the light, and temperatures that the light may have seen. So this is all valuable information uh, that can be used uh, then to either detect early failures or to preventative maintenance. Thank you. The next question I have here says, is it possible for the environment of the machine vision system to affect LED output? Well, yes. Um, if you're in a very hot ambient temperature, uh, it would be a, a place that LED output would definitely be impacted, if you, especially if you're not using a controller, right? 
because if you're applying a straight 24 volts or 12 volt voltage source to the light uh, and you have a very hot environment, then the difference in current that's going to flow through that LED is going to change uh, from the time you first power the machine on to later on when those temperature fluctuations occur. And sometimes these are random because, uh, uh, you know, the environment is such that a factory may not be heated or cooled properly, so these fluctuations can literally occur hourly, uh, which is going to impact the results of your inspection system. Thank you, John. Uh, looks like I have a, another question here, but I'd just like to remind everybody while we still have a few minutes that if they have any questions for John uh, while he's on the line, that they can use the Ask a Question area of the console to do so, and we'll do our best to get those answered for you. So the next question I have here says, do you also sell controllers for tungsten halogen lamps, which as far as we know are preferred for particular vision tasks over LEDs? Uh, and he includes the example of uh, hyperspectral analysis. Um, Gardasoft does not sell controllers for uh, tungsten halogen lamps. However, there are other manufacturers that do uh, make devices for these. Uh, they're, as you, you know, you point out, they might be preferential for hyperspectral analysis. It's uh, just not as uh, as likely to be found as uh, LED lights, and we haven't uh, created a controller for them. But again, others do. Hey, thank you, John. Well, um, it doesn't look like we have any questions in the queue, but I would I would just like to remind everybody that if uh, another question happens to pop up, that they could reach out to myself or to John, and we'll do our best to get those answered for you uh, in a timely fashion. So with that said, on behalf of Vision Systems Design and Gardasoft and Penwell Corporation, we'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. This presentation will be archived within 24 hours and can be accessed from our homepage, and a reminder email will be sent to all registrants complete with a direct link to the archive. And once again, um, if, if you have any questions and you'd like to reach out, my email is jamesc at penwell.com, uh, and you can contact me um, any multiple places on the website if you, if you need to. So uh, with that said, we thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to providing you with webcasts in the future.